Better Call Saul, Queso, written by Jimmy Prosser. Teaser, fade in, exterior high school blacktop day. Flat concrete and grit, the Sandia Mountains lurk in the distance behind the fenced teenage playpen, muted before school hours. As the New Mexico sun intensifies, the black tarred pavement releases sweltering waves of heat. We hear a sudden whoosh, followed by a metallic ding. Into view comes our very own Jimmy McGill, dressed in his tacky brown mustard jacket, taupe slacks, and wingtip shoes. Jimmy wipes his sweaty brow and places his hands on the chalky earth, gathering the perfect amount of friction. Mr. McGill. With all his might, Jimmy slingshots the tether ball and rockets it around the tip of the pole. Ding! Takes me back, huh? Want to get in on some one-on-one -on -one action? Jimmy dances in the tetherball circle as if he were a boxer ready for battle. Principal Talbot, 50s, is the overweight, floppy-haired administrator that feeds off of power. But in actuality, he's just a first-class klutz with a perpetual neck suffering. Talbot gives Jimmy's pit-stained mustard suit a deadpan once-over, raises an eyebrow. The students are ready for you, classroom 13B. Already? Sorry, just getting my morning calisthenics in before the big show. Let's ride. Talbot sneers. Jimmy stops his dance and reaches his hand for Talbot to shake. Peace offering? Talbot glares at Jimmy's chalky palms, off Talbot's disapproving look. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. Better run to the little gentleman's room, excuse me. Make it quick. 13B, right? Interior stall, day, moments later. Jimmy mumbles in the bathroom stall. He reviews his cue cards and sits on the toilet. Something seems off. Maybe it's the distasteful greeting with Talbot, maybe it's his morning coffee mixed with the hot weather, maybe it's just nerves, or reminiscence. Thud. Interior urinals continuous. In comes a group of loud punks. They piss at the urinal. One of the boys notices Jimmy slacks around his ankles from underneath the stall window. He taps his buddy next to him. In their eyes, it's an administrator, or better yet, another bird-brained guest lecturer. Best to send a message, whoever it is. He's not welcome. The punks roll out some paper towels, pound the hot water button, and crumble the wet towels into balls. Interior stall, day, continuous. Incoming! A fireball flies over the top and nails Jimmy in the face. What the? Two more fireballs smack him in the chest. He drops his cue cards. Jimmy moves to grab the cards, but he's too late. The dampness from the fireballs causes the ink to bleed on the floor. Ruined. Punks laugh and slam the door. Jimmy lets out a sigh of relief, thinking it's over. Then, snap. Complete blackness. Jimmy panics. He flushes the toilet and aimlessly feels his way through the unknown. We hear him slipping and bumping into things. Then we hear the hand dryer turn on. He finally finds his way to the light switch. Flick. He locks the door, solidifying a necessary moment for composure. A quick rinse, a swift fix of the hair, a huge inhale through the nose, out the mouth. Off Jimmy, departing the bathroom. End teaser. Act one, interior classroom, day. Dingy, broken, creaky desks. Jimmy bursts through the door, the usual spring in his step. The front of his shirt is stained with circular watermarks. The class, made up of scrappy teens, snickers at Jimmy's wet appearance. The word's gotten around already. Jimmy snags a piece of chalk and writes his name on the board. My friends call me Jimmy, but you can call me James. He turns back to the audience optimistically, hoping his joke landed. Crickets. Jimmy dots his full name off with an attorney at law and gazes at the ceiling, hoping for some kind of inspiration. Instead, he sees a slogan along the wall. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. Wow, even for Jimmy that's lame. He shakes his head. <laughs> All right, fellas. Your principal, Talbot? Wants me to do this kind of steered straight thing about higher education and career paths or what have you. This helping young people help themselves nonsense. I realize I'm here to speak to you about life choices and the importance of consequential thinking. But as I look out upon you, I remember being a teenager. And oh, to be 17 again, let me tell you, the hormones were oozing, the birds were chirping, and the sky was a nice royal blue. If I were held liable for the dumb decisions I made when I was your age, oh <laughs> boy, baptize me ten times over. You're here today listening to me jabber-jabber because you did something sketchy or you look shady. 
A big, tatted-up bully in the front row glares at Jimmy. Wasn't looking at you, big fella. Thousand-yard stare, always. Learned that during my time in the big house. Jimmy shoots him a salute. We get it. You guys think vandalism, gangs, violence, drugs, and alcohol are cool. And you're probably right. They are cool. But what's not cool is when you get pinched and you have to deal with a scumbag attorney like me. Asking you questions, telling you what to do, having the power to control your entire future. All based off of one or many stupid incidents. Did Jimmy convince them? Did he convince himself? An onslaught of booze. Guess not. Paper airplanes and gum fly. An obnoxious teen in a fluorescent hoodie and lip ring stands up. <clears throat> Yo, Mr. Law, what'd you do that was so illegal? Poked your asshole and smelt it? The class roars with laughter as Jimmy loses his ground. He waves his hand for silence. <laughs> Funny kid. If you must know, I started with grift, used to con drunk people with fake Rolexes. The class sarcastically gasps in unison. Man, that's twisted, even for a frog like you. I realized that as I got older, the cons became more complicated, the consequences became more severe, and the people around me matured. My fear amplified, and uh, I knew it was a laughing stock. The audience overtly claps, getting inside Jimmy's head. Students from the back offensively whistle with their fingers. Yeah? While you knuckleheads were looking for your first lay, I was preparing to pass the bar exam. Why are you here? So you can feel better about yourself? Or reflect how far you've come. Be on the other side of the law. Jimmy's pissed now. The gall of these kids. For the first time, Jimmy loses his most powerful weapon, his words. After a brief silence, that feels like an eternity to Jimmy. Knock it off, guys. You don't recognize this fool? Jimmy and the class whip their heads toward a student in the back row. Bobby Valentino, 17, a Mexican boy with purple bags under his eyes, leans back in his chair. Come on, man. He was on the news. This dude rescued Matt's uncle from falling off that billboard by the freeway a while back. He's an Albuquerque hero, dog. The audience approvingly chatters to one another. Jimmy realizes this is his opportunity. Who is this boy? Why is he defending me? Who, me? <laughs> nah, you kidding. Bobby lowers his eyebrow. Dude, what are you doing? Yeah, yes, that was me. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, um, Bobby. Bobby Valentino. Thanks a lot, Bobby. Remember, guys, everybody hates lawyers until they need one. Interior diner, day. Hector Salamanca sits at a booth across from Nacho Varga. Nacho is face down in his plate as he devours the last remnants of his hash browns. Hector hasn't touched his huevos rancheros. The big boss's mind is neither here nor there. Hector gazes over at some dude going to town on some parmesan cheese. He shakes it, takes the cap off, and pours a huge amount on his pasta. Note, the following is in Spanish. Disgusting. Sauce picante? Nacho hovers his hand over the Cholula hot sauce on the side of the table. Hector brushes it off. Nacho snags his water glass. The cheese business of Mexico into Texas making its way west. DA has already found its traces in Albuquerque schools. Nacho scrunches his face. Are you serious? Yeah, I know about it. Too many ODs. We need to wet our beaks. Somebody's on our turf with it already. Hector, queso will hurt our meth scheme. We serve a quality product that still needs a lot of tending. It's not mud, it's tar, black tar, Tylenol PM, cheap, profitable, addictive. Why cut our own thing down before it has time to grow? Because our revenue's down. A different avenue worth exploring. Too much risk involved. Hector shoots Nacho a cruel look. Nacho, my friend. Heroin's a warm blanket for these kids. Why not benefit off their seclusion? I'm just saying, a couple kids overdosed and their parents are still gonna look for somebody else to blame. Nacho's got a point there. If it were anybody else, Hector might have banked down, but this is the dawn. Whatever he says goes. I want to know who the competitor is on our territory and replace them so we can see who we're dealing with. Nacho's frustration is palpable. Why isn't he listening? If you don't do as I say, I'll pull your brain out through your nose. Don Salamanca stands up from the table and puts on his hat. You're paying. He steams off. Nacho pushes his food away from his body. Exterior gas station day. Jimmy drums the roof while he waits for his putrid yellow Suzuki to fill up. As the gas meter boosts, Jimmy eyes a familiar face inside the convenience store. Through the glass, we see Bobby mopping the grimy floors. I'll be damned. Interior convenience store day moments later. Ding dong. 
Bobby Valentino, in the flesh. I thought that was you, you gosh darn messiah. Jimmy takes a bow. Thank you, again, for earlier. Jimmy reaches his hand out. Bobby takes it. Jimmy wraps his thumb around Bobby's thumb as an attempt to seem cool. A genuine but awkward handshake. Don't worry about it. Least I can do, Mr. Phil. Jimmy, Bobby, please. Jimmy. Thought that name was only for friends. He's quick, this kid. Jimmy respects that. Well, a lot of my supposed friends wouldn't do what you did today. You earned it. So, why'd you uh, stick up for me, if you don't mind my asking? Nobody ever stuck up for me. Recognized the familiar panic in your eyes. Thought you needed some defense. Shucks, kid, you're too kind. But a couple of knuckleheads can't rattle my bones. Malt beverages, where are they at? Off Bobby's perplexed look. What? A lawyer can't have a refreshing buzz after a long day of charitable work? Bobby points to the only refrigerator in the entire store. Ah, of course. Jimmy wanders over to the refrigerator and snags a beer and clumsily drops it. Oh, it's just one of those days. The can starts fizzing everywhere. Shit. Jimmy apprehensively looks up. No problem, Jimmy. Really, I got it. Grab yourself a meal. I'm really sorry, Bobby. Bobby moves towards the mess and dips the mop head into the bucket of soap water. Hey, you know, I used to mop up in my father's store. My back used to ache like hell, but then I learned this technique. Oh, yeah? Jimmy gestures for the mop. Bobby hands it over. Get an athletic stance. Wrist is cocked and loaded, forearms extended but not locked. Bobby's boss, Frank, 60s, juts his head out from the back office. We see him, but Jimmy can't. Bobby, stop talking to the customer. Get that cleaned up. Someone's gonna slip. Jimmy tries to see who said that. The door slams. Yes, sir. Thanks, Jimmy. We'll work on it. I'll ring you up. Sure. Jimmy nabs another beer and follows Bobby to the counter. That your boss? Seems a little, uh... Jimmy curves his fingers so they look like claws. Controlling. Frank? Nah, he's a good guy. He's been a better dad to me than my father ever was. Been working for him for years. That'll be three bucks. Jimmy opens his wallet. You know what? Jimmy reaches down under the counter. He bypasses the standard beef jerky packages and snags a couple packets of the more gourmet kind. He slams the jerky and the beer on the counter. Here's a 20. Keep the change, Bobby. Bobby nods his head thanks. Jimmy cracks his beer and ding dong! Interior parking garage, day. We're in our familiar meeting spot. Mike waits casually, arms crossed, stone-faced. He checks his watch. Where is he? Vroom! Nacho drifts his truck around the corner. He slams the brakes, causing the lifted tires to screech. Inches away from Mike. No flinching here. Nacho rolls down his window. Thought I'd give you a little scare. You gonna tell me why we're here? Nacho unlocks the truck and gestures Mike to come inside. Got something I want you to take care of. Mike unenthusiastically opens the passenger seat door, and lifts his body up. Okay. For something or someone? An investigation. An investigation. Of something or someone? Queso. I don't know who that is. Cheese, Mike. A drug. A new one. Moving west from Dallas. Easy on the pocketbook. We want it. Mike's buttoned up. He's heard this before. I don't do drugs. I don't traffic drugs. I don't deal drugs. Got it? We're not asking you to do any of that. We just need to. Absolutely not. Seen the news? That Parmesan plague rots kids. I'm not hurting kids. Whether you like it or not, somebody's going to capitalize. Why not us? It's not our fault, brainless teenagers. Not getting involved. Do what you want. Leave me out of it. Mike, I don't want your help to sell it. I just want you to find out who's selling it. Eight grand for a week's worth of work. Mike wraps his fingers around the door handle. Thanks for wasting my day. Look, I know you need the extra cash, and Hector's not giving me much of a choice. If I don't follow through on this, I'm six feet under with worms crawling through my eye sockets. Please, I need your intel, your help. Nacho searches Mike's impenetrable eyes. Undecipherable, poker-faced Mike, but Mike's been silent for too long. He hasn't left. Is he actually contemplating this? Where? Nacho grins. He slips Mike a piece of paper. We don't see what's written, but we're certain Mike doesn't like it. Off Mike's slow exhale. Figure out who the dealers are. 
find the supplier, whatever way possible. Mike shifts his weight a little. One condition. Sure. Distribution must be safer. Thin it out. Order it down. Make overdoses more preventable. You have my word. We'll make sure the Kesso's cut with powdered milk. Nobody will tell the difference. Mike cracks the door open. We're through here. He hops out. Mike, wait. I can get you some work. What's your pick? Janitor? Lunch duty? Landscaping? My intel, my rules, my agenda. Interior nail salon, Jimmy's office night. Dark and dim, another late night. Jimmy's painfully editing one of his commercials at his desk. His phone buzzes. Jimmy clocks it, but lets the call ring out. Why is he waiting so long to answer? Nerves? Does he want people to think he's busy? At the last second, Jimmy straightens himself up. James McGill speaking. Intercut is necessary. Interior jail at night. Bobby speaks into a payphone against tiled walls. He's bent over, resting his elbow on top of the phone box, sick to his stomach. His voice is muffled. Jimmy? It's Bobby. Valentino. I'm in juvie. You gotta help me out here. I, I need a lawyer ASAP. Talk to me, Bobby. What the hell happened? That's what I don't understand. The fuzz raided my locker. Somebody planted a gun. Is there anybody out to get you? Any students pissed off? No. No, not that I know of. Jimmy pulls his hair back. <sighs> When's your 18th birthday? Two weeks. Christ on the cross. Those charges have to be dismissed quickly. Are you saying we because you're my lawyer? Jimmy loses his mouth again. Jimmy! I, I can't. I can't be your lawyer. I'm sorry. I'm not the guy. Uh, my license is, uh, it's suspended. Thanks for your help. Peace. Bobby goes to hang up the phone. Bobby, Bobby, hold up. Wait a second. I'll see what I can do. Remember, I'm a lawyer who knows lawyers. You were a lawyer who apparently knows nobody. Bobby, this is my job. Stay calm. I'll see what I can do to help you out. You told us to get on the straight and narrow, and you lost your license. You really suck as a lawyer. I realize this, but it's not as bad as it sounds, I swear. Bail me out. Look for me at your arraignment. I'll be there. Until then, keep your mouth shut. Back to scene. Jimmy's inert, holding his head in his hands. We see into his stormy mind. Interior arcade day. Begin flashback. 1970s, Jimmy, 17, plays the Wheel of Wonder game at the crowded arcade. It's clear that Jimmy's on a date with a sour blonde teenage girl hanging distant from him. We don't ever see her face. The colorful wheel spins. Jimmy sticks his tongue out, measuring the perfect time. Whack! Shit, just short. A wah, 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 trumpets out the machine. Jimmy frantically pops another quarter in. Please, God, let me impress her. He composes himself, getting into the zone. The wheel spins. Rotating light darts. Gotcha. Ding, ding, ding. Celebratory lights gleam as lucrative tickets gush out the slot. Jimmy's date jumps up and down cheering. Feels like Vegas, baby. The jackpot and the girl. Interior prize counter moments later. Jimmy winks at his date and points to the giant stuffed orangutan on the wall behind the employee. The employee grabs the prize and passes the stuffed animal to Jimmy's date. Jimmy blushes as she embraces her two cuddly dates at the same time. Got about 200 tickets left. Jimmy presses his face against the glass, inspecting every option. His eyes light up at Danger Dan's disappearing ink gag pen. Jimmy taps on the glass. This, please. Exterior mansion, gated community, day. Outside a mansion, Jimmy and Marco, 17, are dressed in suits and ties. Jimmy approaches door with cockiness. Marco hangs back a little. Don't know about this, Jimbo. Jimmy slaps him on the back. Confidence. You gotta be able to sell a whale a glass of water. What? Knock, knock, knock. Don't worry about it. An old woman, 70s, opens the door. Gentlemen, how can I help you? Marco looks to Jimmy to take the lead. Jimmy's happy to do so. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. My associate and I are roaming this glorious neighborhood asking for donations to our charity. The fund for the uplift of the unjustly poor. Many of the other members in the community have been generous enough to grant us contributions. How much does one usually give? Jimmy grins. He's got her hooked. That was easy. Reel her in. It's hard to put a tag on equality. Whatever you believe is necessary to make an impact on the future is what we expect. Because, to quote Abe Lincoln, nobody's equal until we're all equal. Jimmy shoots the old woman puppy dog eyes. Don't have any cash. She starts to close the door. Jimmy stops it with his foot. 
Man to Jack. We uh, actually prefer Jacks. She turns back around. It's safer for you, after all. Jimmy shines his pearly whites. The old woman ponders and then nods her approval. Wait here. The old woman disappears. Marco looks to Jimmy, who's totally composed. She comes back holding a check and a pen. Who do I make this out to? The fund for the uplift of the unjustly poor, please. She tries to write on the check, but her shaky hands don't have enough strength to press the ink properly. Jimmy spots his opportunity. Think your pen is out of ink, ma'am. Here, take this. Jimmy whips out his gag pen from his front pocket and hands it to the old woman. Marco, chop chop. This woman needs a proper hard surface. Marco makes a 180, bends his knees, and stiffens his back. He holds his laugh in as the old lady writes on his shoulder blades. Exterior trash cans, day later. Jimmy and Marco are off in a corner counting the collected checks. Marco holds a lighter. We see the original two line on one of the checks has disappeared. Instead, we see James McGill written in. Jimmy changes the amount on the other checks to something more generous. Simultaneously, Marco sparks the lighter and burns the signature box. The original ink stays. Cha-ching. Let's cash him, baby. Up top. Jimmy goes for a high five. Marco disses him. Jimmy grabs Marco and immediately puts him in a headlock. A cop from across the street sees the boys wrestling on the ground laughing. Checks scatter around them. The cop yanks his cuffs off his police belt. Interior, jail, night. Jimmy, dressed in an orange jumpsuit, talks to Chuck through a glass barrier. They both hold phones to their ear. You can't think consequences don't apply to you. The law is untouchable, sacred. Rules are not meant to be shattered. I know, I'm through with these antics, I promise. This is the last time, I'm sorry. You can't be serious. Fake charities, disappearing ink. What kind of party games are you running? Twindling is, is no sport. These are people's lives. I've learned my lesson. Please, Chuck, I'm your brother, your blood. Let us go home together. Chuck hangs up the phone and stands up. We still hear him speak, but Jimmy can't. It's just noise to him. Discipline is what you need. Change is possible through punishment. Jimmy desperately bangs on the glass barrier as Chuck departs. End flashback. Interior, Kim's law firm office, day. Jimmy speaks to Kim in her office. Kim cleans her messy desk. Not a chance. I'm too overwhelmed already getting this firm off the ground. Not accepting new clients. Oh, come on. Nobody protected him when he was a kid, and nobody's sticking up for him now. Kim looks up, icy. Why does that matter? What's in it for me? Why is this case worth taking? Geez, that was direct. I'll do the legwork and trial prep if you take the case officially, I promise. No. Why? You won't have to bat an eyelash. I just need someone to represent Bobby somehow. I'm not risking my license, my future, just so you can rid of your guilt. Jimmy's hurt by this. He bites his lip. Listen, I understand, but this is a sure win. He's innocent, and Judge Rodriguez was just appointed to the case. He didn't get Jones? Thank God, Jones is a motherfucker. Exactly. I know for a fact Rodriguez will be sympathetic. He has a teenage son. Kim ponders it over. Please give me this. Long beat. Keep your methods legitimate. End of Act 1. Act 2. Interior courtroom, day. Bobby's arraignment. Bobby, dressed in an orange jumpsuit, looks desperately for Jimmy. He sees no familiar faces. The judge is about to see him. Number 86501, Valentino. How do you plead? Guilty or not? Bobby stands facing the judge. He doesn't know what to say. His eyes dart around the room one last time. Say something. Uh... Not guilty. To the rescue, Kim beelines to Bobby's side, briefcase in hand. Jimmy is seen behind her, closing the courtroom door. He takes a seat in the back. Your Honor, I was just retained for Bobby Valentino, Kim Wexler. Bobby spins his head toward Jimmy. Jimmy nods and lifts his takeout coffee cup. See, I know lawyers. Bail is set at $5,000. Judge slams his gavel. Bobby is escorted to the side by a government official. He turns back to Jimmy. I'm gonna bail you out right now. Don't worry. Kim stands by Jimmy. Jimmy pulls her aside so Bobby can't hear. Listen, I don't have the 10% fee for the bail bondsman. You don't have $500 stashed around somewhere? You're a grown man. You know how it's been. Jimmy looks down at his wingtips. He's 
not a thug, Kim. This is an innocent boy, a framed boy we're talking about. Yeah, he's had a tough life, but trust me, he's no crook. You would know, wouldn't you? Jimmy swishes coffee in his mouth to refrain him from saying something stupid. That hurt. Gulp. Can you lend me the 500, please? I'll pay you back in full. You know I'm good for it. You make a lot of demands for somebody who doesn't have leverage. Don't give me that lawyer thing. This is more than that. Long beat. While Kim contemplates this, did Jimmy just talk back to me? No. When people see you around here, they think I'm assisting a suspended attorney. I can't risk being suspended too. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to help Bobby. But he's going to sit in his cell until the trial. A corrections officer escorts Bobby out. Jimmy watches and swallows his pride. Okay. See you later. Maybe. If you behave. Kim walks out. Jimmy takes a seat at a bench in the back. He holds his face in his palms. Mr. McGill? Jimmy glances up. What's it to you? Name's Frank, Bobby's boss. Bobby said you'd be here. Hi, Frank. Jimmy stands up and shakes Frank's hand. Sorry about the mess I made earlier. Those beer cans. What are they made of again? Aluminum? <laughs> Man, they get slipperier and slipperier every day. I'll tell you that much. Frank disregards Jimmy's poorly framed apology. He's a cut to the chase kind of guy. Judge set bail at five thousand dollars. How do we pay the bail bondsman? You got five hundred. Exterior high school parking lot booth, day. Mike sits on a stool as Principal Talbot shows him how to work the surveillance cameras. Mike stares off into space. This is child's play to him. Click this button to change locations. Got cameras set up in strategic places all around the campus. We're not well funded, so all you got is this black and white. No sound. Talbot bends his gut over the table and flips through the different locations. His ass crack glares at Mike. Mike picks up on it, but goes back to being blank-faced. If you see any contraband, confiscate and report. If you see any students parked illegally in teacher spots, write. Write down their name and report. Follow me? Mm, all right. Talbot flips to a different location. Bobby's on the camera, walking to class. Keep an eye out for this kid. Bobby Valentino. He's a bad seed. Claimed he was in the bathroom when the profits from the Lasagna fundraiser went missing. I don't buy it. Any discipline? No proof. Nothing suspicious on the surveillance. Mike nods. Had 5-0 check out his locker as a precaution. And what do you know? Found a gun, just posted bail, so keep your eyes glued to his ass. Any questions? You know where my office is. Will do. Drop the ticket pad off at my office, Friday afternoon. Mike nods. Ka-chunk. Door closes behind Talbot. Mike flips open his crossword puzzle booklet. Exterior, high school parking lot, day. Mike, wearing his security vest, leisurely walks down the rows of cars, seeing if they're parked illegally. The hot Albuquerque sun gleams off his bald head. He stops at a Dodge Charger parked in a teacher's space. Mike marks the tires with chalk. Unbeknownst to Mike, there's a couple getting hot and heavy in the back seat. Teen girl stops teen boy from kissing her neck. She gestures to the front mirror. In the reflection, we see Mike open up his notepad. Mexico D13. Teen boy hops in the front seat, pants around his ankles. He pops the key in, hits the ignition. Vroom! The engine roars. Mike lifts his head up. Son of a... Mike's caught off guard. The surprise causes him to drop his pen and ticket book. The charger flies back, reversing into Mike. Mike's hit! He slams his face against the back window and falls onto the pavement. The tires run over his pen, broken. The charger darts around the parking lot and exits the campus. Interior courthouse, hallway, day. Jimmy strolls down the hallways of the court, game face on, bounce in his step. Calls out to the court receptionist. DA, where is he? The receptionist points to the DA's office, literally right behind Jimmy's back. Gotcha. Interior courthouse office, day, moments <clears throat> later. Knock at the door. The district attorney, male, 40s, sits at his desk, reading a brief. Come in. Jimmy enters. The DA grins. Oh, this side would be good. McGill, what do I owe the sweet pleasure? Listen, my client, Bobby Valentino, wants to move up his trial date week from today. D.A. scoffs. I thought you were suspended. My guy, Miss Wexler's client, is entitled to a speedy trial, so let's get this show moving. Your guy. My guy, her guy, what's the matter? Kim knows Bobby legally, I know him personally. You tell me the difference. You and I both know there's a very big difference. Now, where is Miss Wexler? Kim's late. She'll be here any second. Bullshit. Why would I help you? Just let this proceed regularly. Come on now. 
You and I both know this is a scrap case. Don't let this drag on longer than it needs to be. Or I end this discussion right here. Report you and Wexler to the Bar Association. How's that sound? <sighs> hey, don't let our personal beef get in the way of some kid's future. Leave Kim and Bobby out of this. You're a busy man, a good lawyer. This case is one less thing off your plate. Let's move it up. Long beat. The DA waits for Jimmy to squirm, but Jimmy's confident. Fire in his eyes. No fidgeting here. Despite Jimmy's annoyance, lawyer to former lawyer, the DA respects his persistence. Sure. What do I care if he goes to jail sooner? Exterior high school parking lot day. Mike's on his ass. He rubs his face and unbuttons his vest. Blood seeps through the linen. That hurt. Mike peeks at his pen and ticket book. The ticket book's fine, but the pen is smashed. He looks to his booth on the other side of the campus. Damn, that's far. In the short distance, Mike eyes another car with a rolled down driver's window. He stands up. A quick peek inside. Yes, a red pen stuck in the sunshade. Mike pops his head out and glances around the parking lot. When he's here, he leans in to carefully grab a pen. Suddenly, the car alarm sounds. Any normal person would be frazzled, but this is Mike. He's as cool as a cucumber. He reaches behind the steering wheel to the fuse panel, yanks the red wire, then the white wire. The alarm finally stops. Mike breathes a sigh of relief, grabs the pen, and pulls his head out, only to come face to face with Bobby. Busted. Just grabbing my pen. Mike waves the pen in the air. Bobby laughs. All good, dude. Not my car. The secret's fine by me. Mike walks off, pissed, muttering again, shit, that was close. Exterior, nail salon, night. Bobby arrives and sees the closed sign hanging from the front door. He peers inside. Jimmy's reading a glamour magazine in a massage chair with his feet in a hot bubble tub. Bobby pounds on the glass window. Jimmy notices Bobby and shoots him a one-second signal. Jimmy dries his feet off and meanders towards Bobby. He opens the door. Great news, Bobby. Got the trial moved up to next week. Just before the big one eight, this will all be over before you know it. To Jimmy's surprise, Bobby's not enthusiastic at all. Found this on my lunch tray. Bobby gives Jimmy a yellow post-it note. Close on, bite the bullet, you snitch, you die. Come inside, let's prep. End of act two. Act three, exterior high school parking lot booth, day. Class just got let out, it's mayhem. From his booth, Mike carefully watches the students hanging out including Bobby. They fight, flirt, pass joints, etc. A teen in a fluorescent hoodie, the obnoxious kid from Jimmy's speech earlier, waits by the fire hydrant on his phone. A green Plymouth Barracuda with tinted windows rolls into the parking lot and parks in front of the fire hydrant, blocking Mike's field of vision. Suspicious. There's no hesitation as Mike gets out of his booth and moves toward the Barracuda. Speed walking, he jots down the license plate number and works on a ticket. After all, it is parked illegally. Hey, can't park there. As Mike approaches the vehicle's side, the Barracuda speeds off, leaving Mike in a cloud of exhaust. Mike chases after it, but it's too damn fast. He snaps his head around and sees fluorescent hoodie walking away, carrying a big golden envelope under his shirt. Mike picks up his speed and follows the teenager past the gym, down the hallway, turning a corner, and damn, where'd he go? Mm. Interior nail salon, Jimmy's office, night. Jimmy stands at a whiteboard in his office, marker in hand. Bobby sits on a chair, listening. We're in the middle of their prep session. What's the goal of the trial? To win? Yes, to win, but it's more than that. Afterwards, regardless of the outcome, you'll realize the goal of the trial is to change. Change is the law of life, my friend. And if you only concentrate on what you've done in the past, you'll certainly miss the future. Bobby scrunches his nose. You think I'm guilty, don't you? You really think I'm... Well, I'm not saying that. I'm just being realistic. A good lawyer manages a client's expectations. Oh, so this is about you being a good lawyer now. Ouch. I'm speaking to you honestly about the risk involved. Don't make this about you, dude. Bobby, you're acting paranoid. Bobby flies up from his chair. Fuck yeah, I'm acting paranoid. My life is on the line. Bobby paces. Stay calm. Remember, I'm the one that's here to help you. No, you're here to help yourself. You could just sit. If we lose, I rot in jail and you carry on with your everyday life. There's no consequences for you. My lawyer is supposed to be my biggest supporter, and my actual lawyer isn't even here to prep me. I'm stuck. I'm stuck with you, a man without a license who thinks I'm... Look, you defended me one time, and now you put me in this position to save your entire future. How does that make me feel, huh? 
You tell me how that's equal. I'm bending my back to save somebody I met a week ago. So you're doing this as a favor? No. You know it's more than that. Is it? A long beat. I don't know what's gotten through your thick skull, but let me tell you something. I need a stroke of luck. My license has been revoked. I put my gal in a terrible position, and my sick brother would rather watch me die than succeed in life. When I was your age, I needed a mentor. I chose this profession because I wanted to develop right alongside my client. I wanted to provide the nourishment. I wanted to help the unjustly accused. After this trial, whether you like it or not, it will change you. My expectation is to win. That's it. I know you're clean. It's as simple as that. I can feel the big break coming, and it's coming for the both of us, Bobby. I can feel it in my bones. Let's just be confident that our legal system will bring us both justice. Wow. Bobby shuts up. He nods and sits back down. Let's fucking go. Jimmy claps his hands together and turns back to his whiteboard. Interior nail salon day. Jimmy and Bobby are fast asleep in separate massage chairs. Jimmy looks disheveled, his hair is frayed, and his collar is messed up. Bobby is in a wife beater and boxers. Empty coffee cups, documents, and Red Bulls are scattered around on the floor. Jimmy's phone vibrates in his front shirt pocket. He agonizingly wakes up and answers. Yeah. Intercut as necessary. Interior, Kim's law firm office, day. Kim paces. Jimmy's on speakerphone. Did you just wake up? Jimmy looks over at Bobby, who's sleeping like a clam. He covers the speaker, walks into his office, and quietly shuts the door. No, been up for hours, prepping my client, our client. Why? What's up? We got a problem. Already? I just got the trial date moved up. Thought everything was all hunky-dory. Nobody knows where Judge Rodriguez is. We can't get a hold of him. The court clerk wants to appoint Jones to the case. Shit. Yep. I'll handle it. Any updates, let me know. Interior high school parking lot booth, day. Mike flips through the different channels on his surveillance cameras. Where is he hiding? He finally settles on a jam-packed cafeteria, uses the remote to scan the room. More to the left, and got it. Fluorescent hoodie eats a chimichanga at a lunch table, blending in with the crowd. Mike has his suspect, but he needs concrete evidence before he can inform Nacho. Gotta be clever. Too much force, and he knows he's got a lawsuit on his hands. He departs. Interior courthouse day. Jimmy's in a crowded courthouse. He stops a law clerk, 30s. Psst. Yeah? You heard anything about Rodriguez? He's just been acting so distant, you know? You didn't hear this from me, but his hemorrhoids are being operated on. Hemorrhoids? From all the sitting? Yeah, from all the sitting. What else would it be? Damn, remind me to eat more raisin bread. Thanks for the gossip. Jimmy whips out his phone and dials Kim. Guess we're gonna have to pay the piper. Rodriguez is out. Interior cafeteria, day. Bobby sits at a crowded adjacent lunch table. Everybody's taking notice of fluorescent hoodie. Bobby's point of view, fluorescent hoodie is clearly nodding off. His eyes low, head swaying, his legs shaking. Mike enters through the nearby door. Bobby lifts his vision to Mike. Panic hits. Why is he coming for me? I said I wouldn't tell anybody. He shuts his eyes pushing his way through the masses. Mike spots Bobby, but moves right past him. He's on a mission. Bobby opens his lids. Phew, must have missed me. He stands from the table and quickly leaves the cafeteria. Mike's point of view. Flores and Hoodie takes a sip from his milk carton, stabs his plastic spork into the cheesy chimichanga, lifts it up to his tongue, coughing, choking, spit bubble foam, a baby burp followed by a baby puke, and collapse on the floor. Somebody call 911! Mike's bombarded by students surrounding the clammy body. Fluorescent Hoodie lies on the floor like a rag doll, twisted on his back, puked down his front, face contorted, slack jawed. Mike's seemingly paralyzed, although we know deep inside his emotions are churning. Match cut to interior principal's office day. Principal Talbot rewinds the footage of what we just witnessed on his computer screen. Mike stands nearby watching. Talbot pauses on Bobby at the lunch table. See, watch this. He presses play. On the monitor, Bobby stands up and hustles out of the cafeteria, while everybody else seems to be rushing toward Fluorescent Hoodie's body. Valentino's finished. He's definitely played a role in the overdose. But you're not entirely certain. At this point, this tape has all the evidence I need. Talbot presses a button that signals his secretary. Shannon, please have Bobby Valentino report to my office immediately. Will do. What are you going to do with him? Spell his ass. What do you think? Now get going. 
I need some privacy. Mike lets out a long exhale and slowly leaves. End of Act 3. Act 4. Interior school hallway. Day. Mike walks down a littered hallway on his way to Principal Talbot's office to drop off his ticket pad. He flips through the pages to make sure it's filled out properly. He stops at the ticket he wrote for the Plymouth Barracuda and makes a mental note of the license plate number. Interior principal's office, moments later. Mike's greeted by Talbot's secretary. Off Mike's stony face, her smile quickly turns into a glare. Mike picks up on this, but he doesn't care. Let me go home for the weekend. Talbot around? Dropping this off. Mike waves his ticket pass. He's yeah. with a student in his office right now. Mike looks behind her. Through the plastic white blinds, we see Bobby's hunched back. He's upset enough to cry, but tough enough to hold it in. Talbot's quirky arm flies through the air. His flushed face looks like it's about to burst. This isn't ending anytime soon. Off Mike's deadpan gaze. Might be a while. In that case. Mike takes a seat, opens up his crossword booklet, and crosses his leg over his knee. He glances up from his puzzle and sees Bobby crying. Poor kid. Mike thinks to himself, whips out his pen, and circles the Plymouth Barracuda license plate number. He continues to write a note. A long beat. Can I leave this in his mailbox? I'm actually in a hurry. Sure. Mike stands up, walks over to a row of mailboxes, and sets his notepad down in Talbot's. Thanks. He takes one last look at Bobby and makes his way out. Interior courtroom, day. Bobby's trial is underway. Jimmy sits in the back gallery, hunched over, covering his mouth with his hands. Frank shakes his leg next to him. They are both dialed in. Judge Jones returns to his podium from recess. Let's get this shit show back on the road. He sits down. Who's going to jail today? The DA and an assistant sit at the prosecutor's table next to the jury box. Kim and Bobby sit at the defense table. The DA stands. Your Honor, we'd like to call our main witness, Principal Chip Talbot. Chip Talbot, please approach and take the witness stand. There's a long silence. Bobby's eyes dart. The jury looks around the room. Nobody's approaching. Jimmy starts picking his teeth. Where is he? I repeat, Chip Talbot, please take the stand. Nothing. Unless this so-called main witness or another equally compelling human being appears within the next 10 seconds, I'm dismissing the charges. DA looks around, confused. Your Honor, if, if you just give me a day, I can... You rush this mess of a case onto my docket without a good reason, and now you want me to stop the show because you don't have your act together? Looks like your lucky day. Judge bangs his gavel. Case dismissed. Everyone is baffled. Jurors and gallery members discuss among themselves. Jimmy runs over to Kim and Bobby and gives both of them hugs. Exterior road, day. The green Plymouth Barracuda stops Mike on his way home from work. Mike braces himself, squints his eyes. The tinted window rolls down, revealing Gus Fring's henchman, Victor, 20s. Where are you heading, Gramps? Need a ride? Nope. Victor raises a gat and casually scratches his cheek with it. Get in the car. There's air conditioning. Mike hesitantly gets inside. He has no other choice. Interior, Plymouth Barracuda, day, moments later. That was quite the stunt you pulled earlier. How do you know it was him? Who? Don't play dumb. Mike knows Victor's got him. Look, I don't know you. I don't want to know you. My lips are sealed. I just don't want to see an innocent kid hurt. That's all. Victor scoffs. Innocent. That fool brought his own gun to school. Thought he needed protection. Mike's eyes fall. Damn. But despite him being full retard, he's still a pretty good hustler. Worth saving. Mike's speechless, sick to his stomach. No. Somebody tipped off that fat principal motherfucker, and I'm thinking that somebody's you. I was just doing my job, turning in my ticket book. You were parked blocking a fire hydrant. Didn't know anything else. Now the principal. Oh, don't worry about him. That garbage won't be bothering anyone again. Victor slowly raises his gat onto the center console towards Mike. You like that? It's a gift from Bobby. I promise you, I won't be a problem. Victor cocks the gat. Don't think we won't be watching. Gus has eyes everywhere. If you know what's good for you, tell Nacho and he, that he and Hector better stay out of our way. Don't want to see any of your faces snooping around here anymore. Yes. Now get out. Sure the feds are around. Mike happily exits. The Plymouth Barracuda speeds off. 
Exterior desert day. Three police cars zoom down the flat, desolate Albuquerque land. Cop number one holds a license plate number and a GPS. He signals to his partner who's driving. Coming up, here on the left. The three cop cars follow the route. They hook a left and speed down a barren path, finally approaching a Plymouth Barracuda. The cop cars circle the vehicle. The police officers move out, guns pulled. They carefully walk towards the vehicle, thinking somebody might still be inside. They arrive at the car, and it's abandoned. Nobody's around for miles. Cop number one peers inside. All that's left in the car is a green parmesan cheese shaker on the dashboard. He pulls on the car door. It's unlocked. He grabs the shaker and gums the cheese, only to realize it's real parmesan. Damn, that's good. Exterior nail salon night. Jimmy's locking up the nail salon. He's singing Sinatra to himself, clearly ecstatic about the big win. When I was 17, it was a very good year. Jimmy turns to leave when a 1996 Ford Taurus pulls up in front of the nail salon. The window rolls down. Jimmy walks outside. It's Victor, now in a different vehicle. Victor tosses a full plastic grocery bag through the passenger window. It lands with a thud in front of Jimmy. I told Bobby you were a good lawyer. Victor speeds off. Confused, Jimmy looks at his feet. He looks around, reaches down, and picks up the bag, carries it to his car. Interior, Suzuki, night. Moments later, Jimmy sits in the driver's seat and opens the plastic bag. Inside are wads of cash. Jimmy's cheerful smile quickly turns into a frown. Did I just get played? Exterior, house, night. Knock, knock, knock. Bobby answers the door. The cops greet him. Uh-oh. Mr. Valentino, we have a warrant to search the property. Please step aside. Interior house, night, continuous. Despite Bobby's attempt to shut the door, the cops enter the house. They push Bobby to the side and move towards the living room. They find his backpack and search it. Inside are syringes and many plastic bags filled with cheese. The cops turn back to Bobby. That's not mine, I swear. Exterior, front yard, night, moments later. Bobby's handcuffed and pulled across the yard by the cops. Please, but there's no use. The cops push his head into the back seat of the cop car. We pan down the street to a hidden but familiar looking car. It's Jimmy in his beat to shit yellow Suzuki. Jimmy watches the scene go down and purses his lips. He shakes his head, turns his key, and drives off. End of episode.